Welcome to the National Museum of Women in the Arts, the only museum in the world dedicated and devoted to women artists. How many people are here for, oh, I should say who I am. Right. My name is Milani Douglas. I'm the Director of Public Programs here. And um, this is my third season here. I came here in 2017. And um, I want you to th want to thank you for being a part of this beautiful day with us. And just a general reminder, some housekeeping. Um, please, of course, turn off your cell phones. If you could just take a check, take a peek. I'll look at mine as well. Um, and how many people are here for the first time at the museum? Wow, that's so nice, welcome. So welcome to our new attendees and then also for people that are returning. How many people are returning? All right, so you guys have to show our guests lay of the land. Um, if you have not received one of our programs, this is our season brochure. There'll be some outside available and when you get downstairs, it tells you about our events that are coming up. We um, have, there's a fan, I got a great question. We have a dinner coming up on November 17th. I don't know if you know about Alexander E. Bell. She's awesome, Kim Loper. We're talking about art power in the vote, 100 years after suffrage. And um, the tickets are $25. Does that include the Sunday supper? You're not gonna believe this in DC, it does. Right? We like to make sure that it's accessible for um, everyone to come. We also have Rooms of Her Own, which is women, art, and ownership in the hotel industry. We just um, confirmed that Monique Greenwood would be joining us. She owns a Quaba Inn. She's on Owns Checked In. It's not in there, so you want to know that because she's going to be here. That is also how much? $25. It includes a great cocktail hour and a lot of fun. And then we also have a day of workshops following it. Um, on branding, negotiation. Um, so if you're a business owner and you want to talk about how to take your IG um, brand to uh, ambassadors and to take it to bigger businesses, we have that as well. Um, so it's a lot of great stuff in here, but tonight, the reason that we are all here, um, this is our cultural capital programming. So cultural capital programs allow us to have great partnerships with community organizations um, in universities like Georgetown. Um, we have one, it's, we, we work at the intersection of art and social change. So we focus on the art side of it, but we've got to team up with people to connect you with the social change. We want to move you from inspiration to impact. So we inspire and then connect you with people that you can have impact with. Um, this program, the Girlhood Interrupted, the Black Girls Childhood, is a partnership with the Georgetown University of Law Center on Poverty and Inequality. It's presented as a part of the Women's Museum's Women Art and Social Change Public Program Initiative. We are pleased to work with them um, to provide another platform for a much conversation, a much needed conversation on the topic. Rebecca Epstein, she will give you more. She is the director of the institute and she also I do apologize. I want to make sure I get all this greatness right. She also started an initiative on gender justice and opportunity. Um, we have been working together, uh, Rebecca and Becca and Amanda, to make this event happen, to bring artists that are responding to the event. And Rebecca will tell you more. Rebecca, please. Okay. Good afternoon. Thank you all so much for being here. It's such an honor to be able to discuss our work in this the space of this museum whose core mission we share in elevating women and girls. I'm so appreciative of Milani Douglas for extending this opportunity to us and Amanda Veracruz for working so hard with us on the details and of course to Becca Shapiro, our Director of Administration at the Center on Poverty who handled so much um, often in my absence to make today happen. And we're also thankful to our funders, uh, the Novo Foundation and the Annie E. Casey Foundation who support our work and and really made this event happen. Um, I also have a personal connection with this museum which opened when I was a senior in high school and I was so taken by the beauty of the building that I actually made it the centerpiece of my senior year photography project. So I just hung out in that atrium that you'll be at later and took a bunch of pictures. So I, I spent so many hours in, in the dark room with this museum that I feel like I know it well. 
And because life has a way of always completing the circle now that I'm a grown up and with the Georgetown Law Center on Poverty and Inequality, Milani has uh, extended this, us this amazing opportunity to ask artists to respond to our research. And that's not something that people in the research and policy world often have the chance to do. Uh, but one thing I hadn't known about this building is that it originally housed the Masons. And the Masons didn't used to even allow women as members at all. So I find this moment of lifting black girls up in this museum, a particularly delicious example, um, uh, given that our country's history has shown that the structures of gender discrimination are even slower to fall away when it comes to black women and girls. So the artists that we're celebrating today, Ashley Joy and Sancha McBurney, uh, today seem like particularly fierce examples of Toni Morrison's description of artists as the people who will disturb the plans of those in power and the ones who sing the truth. So before you get to your dessert in the form of those artists and their work and the youth voices that are here today, Jamelia Blake and I are here to provide you with your meat and potatoes course to talk about the research that we conducted. And that'll provide a frame for the conversation and I hope we'll give you some new information that you can take out with you into the world and maybe encourage you to think about things a little bit differently. And our topic today in particular is on the adultification bias of black girls. And we chose to study this form of bias as part of our initiative on gender justice and opportunity, which trains a special focus on marginalized girls. And we do that because we face a crisis in this country that's rarely recognized in mainstream conversations. As we'll talk about in a moment, this crisis, at least a part of it, is that black girls are placed into the juvenile justice system and taken out of the learning spaces of our schools in wildly disproportionate numbers to their white peers. And while there's been a welcome and increasing focus on the welfare of African American boys, still not enough, but it's happening, black girls still remain at the margins of the conversation. So at the initiative, we seek to dig a little bit deeper into black girls' experiences in school and the juvenile justice system. And I turn to Dr. Jamelia Blake to help us do that. Jamelia is a licensed psychologist and an associate professor at Texas A&M University. And I'm so delighted that she could make it here from Texas to co-present with me today. We're gonna do a little bit of a popcorn approach. It's gonna be me and then her and then me and then her. So hopefully we'll keep you entertained even though we're talking about research. So I just wanted to start with the very most basic thing I could, which is telling you what adultification bias is, because we recognize that that's not exactly a term that explains itself. What we're talking about is adults' perception of black girls as fundamentally less innocent and more adult-like compared to their white peers. So it's a form of stereotyping by adults based on observations of, uh, based solely on their own on their stereotypes that they bring into any frame. So it's devoid of any social cues or context at all. It's not based on individual observations of an individual girl, but instead a harmful stereotype. And it isn't a new idea. Black girls have been experiencing adultification bias routinely, so this is far from news for the community. But the reason that we conducted our research anyway was to attempt to provide uh, external validation of those experiences and through data begin to uh, enter into a national conversation. So especially given that adultification bias might help start to explain black girls' disproportionate rates of punitive treatment in our public systems compared to our white peers starting in schools. And the numbers really make the crisis very clear. Black girls receive higher rates of school discipline than white girls, and in fact, higher rates than almost any other group studied. According to the Department of Education, if you look at that bottom line where the bright blue figures are, on the right-hand side, those those figures represent girls, and it shows you that black girls across the country, national data, have been more than five times more likely than their white peers to receive at least one out of school suspension. And on that left hand side where we're representing boys, you can see that that discrepancy between black girls and white girls is actually greater than the difference between white boys and uh, black boys. 
And of course, the consequences of suspensions are very harmful. They've been shown to lead to more suspensions and then in turn are associated with higher risk of expulsion and leaving school altogether. And students who do leave school, at least in uh, one recent study, have been shown to be eight times as likely to wind up in the juvenile justice system. And there's also a more direct connection between school and juvenile justice as well, and that involves the rates of referral to law enforcement and arrest that take place right on campus, so within school walls. And that's increasingly common, of course, as the presence of school resource officers and police officers in school are growing. Um, this slide is based on some work done by the National Women's Law Center here in DC. The bars here represent the difference in enrollment. So you can see that black girls on the left represent a vast minority of enrollment compared to white girls. But they're referred to law enforcement in school almost at the same rate of white girls. And when it comes to arrests, black girls' rate exceeds white girls. And again, that's despite their minority of enrollment. And then once you get into the juvenile justice itself, Black girls have also been shown to be treated more harshly here too, across the board at pretty much every key decision-making point in the system, whether it's referral to the juvenile justice system, diversion or detention or formal petitions, black girls are treated more punitively. So when we began our study, we hoped to provide some insight into that connection and one of the more unexplored potential causes of these disparities. And I'll invite Jamelia up here to talk about the work she did. So what we, what, when we tried to identify what was underlying these disparities, one thing that really stuck out to me in my early work and then collaborating with Rebecca is that perhaps the reason black girls are overdisciplined is because they're not seen as girls at all but instead they're seen as black women. And what's happening is that the stereotypes that fuel how the media and the society um, perceive and react to black women are actually being mapped on black girls, right? So we have three stereotypes historically that black women are characterized by. The mammy stereotype, where we see them as being responsible for being the caretaker, being very selfless. The Jezebel, which we see the hypersexualization, and these originate from slavery. And finally, the Sapphire, which is the angry black woman who is aggressive. And it's really the Jezebel and the Sapphire that we believe are underlying the stereotypes that are fueling this idea that black girls should be overdisciplined, that their behavior should be controlled. And we look at the, the discipline research and we break this down by the type of referrals that black girls get. What we see is that not only are black girls over-disciplined nationally, as Rebecca shown in the earlier slides, but they're disciplined more for what's called subjective um, infractions, right? And those subjective infractions allow those stereotypes, those biases about black women to creep in, right? So we see that relative to white girls, black girls are um, suspended for minor infractions that often involve dress code violations, right? And dress code violations have to do with sexualization and what's appropriate for some body types versus others. Um, we also see that black girls are two and a half times more likely than white girls to be disciplined for being disobedient and having disruptive behavior. Well, the challenge with that, right, is what is disobedience and what's disruptive behavior? They're value laden, right? They're subjective infractions. And if you are sensitive to the stereotype that black women and girls um, are angry, then you're more likely to see benign behaviors as being more aggressive and problematic than they actually are. So when we look to research that says, well, maybe their behaviors are just different, what we find is that actually this disparity between black and white girls being suspended starts at the first, um, the first time they're referred. So the first time that black girls do something wrong, they get a more severe punishment and they're suspended at higher rates than white girls. And again, this is because there's this surveillance, there's this need to control black girls, right? And to, to make sure that they're um, in line because these stereotypes we believe are fueling um, the perception of their behavior. So Philip Goff did a really powerful study 
in 2014, um, he looked at the experiences of black boys and he found that black boys were perceived as less innocent than other children. And adults who viewed black boys as, um, and adults who viewed black boys as adults also saw them as being more culpable for crime. So not only were black boys seen as less innocent, but also more likely to commit a crime relative to other boys of color, regardless of their age. So this prompted our first work of Girlhood Interrupted, where we were really interested in understanding this from the lens of black girls, because they were not studied in golf study. And in this investigation, which has been widely received, we looked at and asked um, individuals in the community, how often are black girls seen as needing to be su supported relative to white girls? And how much do black girls need to be comforted? And how knowledgeable are black girls about sex? So we intended to assess this adultification bias, but we also um, wanted to assess that in the context of the racialized and gendered stereotypes that were specific to black women that we hypothesized were being mapped onto black girls, right? And how independent are black girls relative to white girls? And so what we did is we asked um, respondents these questions for black girls and white girls of different age groups. And as you know, or if you don't know, hopefully you know now, the results were um, astonishing and, uh, and uh, surprising, right? So we found that from zero to four in infancy, there really wasn't a difference. Adults pretty much agreed that black and white infants should be cared for. <laughs> <laughs> right, they should be comforted, and you know this is what we would expect. My mom is always like, "Duh," but it would have been really unfortunate if people responded that they shouldn't. Right, but what really surprised us and really kind of sh struck us to the core, at age five, as early as five, black girls weren't seen as being innocent as white girls, and they weren't seen as needing to be comforted, and they were seen as being more knowledgeable about sex at age five. So imagine having preschoolers, kindergartners, and perceiving them this way, right? And we find that this disparity was the same at age, between the ages of 10 to 14. And in adolescence, it pretty much leveled out in the sense that even though black girls were still seen between 15 and 19 as being more adult-like, they were not seen as being more adult-like as the younger ages. So we find evidence for this bias, right, at least in the larger community. And now I'm gonna pass this on to Rebecca to provide more background. I know. <laughs> It's more like speed rounds than when we're talking to, to the wonks that we usually do, right? Um, so I just want to turn really br briefly to the implications of the findings that Jamelia made. Uh, we didn't directly study in this survey whether these perceptions directly were associated with more um, punitive consequences for black girls. But Goff's study that Jamelia mentioned earlier did exactly that. He saw, he found that black boys are perceived as older and less innocent and that they were held to be more culpable for suspected crimes. So it seems logical and really intuitive to say that we have the same setup for that pattern here. We know that black girls are viewed as older and less innocent, so they are likely too to be uh, held to a higher standard of culpability and to have harsher punishment meted out to them. And that result, treating black girls as if they're presumptively less innocent, really goes against our cultural consensus that we should treat kids differently than we do adults, more leniently than we do adults. So this is where I come in as a lawyer, but I'm, I'm gonna keep it really brief. So the Supreme Court has come out with lots of decisions that I won't talk about in detail, all of which recognize that we should be treating kids more leniently than we do adults. They've recognized uh, that children are fundamentally immature, that they're more vulnerable to peer pressure, and they're still struggling to define themselves. So we ultimately have reasoned that we have to treat children, that they deserve a greater degree of leniency and less severe consequences in our public systems. Because they're defined by their immaturity and by association, 
by their innocence. So that's the theory, and it hardly seems controversial. But in order for that theory to be lived out in practice, the judge or the prosecutor or the educator has to perceive that the person appearing before them is in essence a child. But if an authority figure with discretionary power over a black girl looks at that girl but sees someone who's not that innocent, who knew exactly what she was doing, essentially seeing a mature person rather than a person who's still struggling to define themselves, their determination of consequences for that girl might be harsher than if they were perceiving them as an innocent child. So this bias really has the potential to influence harmful determinations that have huge implications for children. Jamelia, you wanna talk a little bit about the focus groups that you conducted? Okay. So an outgrowth of this work was the reception we got from black women and girls across the country saying, um, this, is, this is my experience. This is, this is what, what happened to me. And what it really inspired Rebecca and I to do is to center the work um, with respect to the voices of black women and girls. So we conducted focus groups around the country um, interviewing black women and girls about the work. Was this true for their experience? Did they agree with this concept of adultification bias? What should we do next? How do we disrupt this? How do we help black women and girls? And um, from someone who led the focus groups and participated in it, it was such an amazing, heartwarming, soul-riching experience. Um, I felt like my soul was filled every time I interacted with these young women. And um, both uh, joyfully but also disappointingly, they said, this is actually true. Right? We are experiencing this bias. We see it in our school systems. We see it in our interaction with uh, educators. We see it in law enforcement. And they shared some very compelling stories about what next, what should happen next. And one of the quotes from the focus groups that really resonated with us is this idea that um, black girls are not able to be their full self. They're not able to bring their full self into the room, into the space, right? Because of this bias, because people are surveilling them, right? And as a mother of two um, young teenagers, my, my daughter says, can I live? Can I live, mom? Usually I'm disciplining her, but <laughs> usually I'm disciplining her, but it comes out into the school system. Can I live? Can I be free to make mistakes? Can I be free to stumble, right? Can I, do I always have to be hypervigilant about how others are seeing me and the way I'm carrying myself and what I'm saying? Can I not just laugh joyfully in the mall and cackle and my girls like to try clothes on and take pictures at Macy's, right? Can I not do these things that are associated with adolescence, that joyfulness, that innocence, right? And unfortunately our report says no. They can, right? And with that, I'd like to uh, hand it over to Rebecca. So we hope you find this research compelling um, and that it inspires you to act. We're often asked when we give these presentations, okay, we hear you, um, what can we do to help make a change? And one of my answers is that building awareness is a key component in any step forward because it helps turn the lens inward at potential bias in ourselves and also outward at the urgent need for change. So if this research resonates with you based on your experiences, uh, we've actually created space online for you to tell your stories. Um, it's called endadultificationbias.org and we urge you to visit and submit your own story or read um, others' stories. And there's also a section called Empowering Others where we invite you to submit resources that you might know of in communities that can help overcome uh, adultification bias. And we actually have laptops and postcards here at the event available at the reception if you wanna do that right here and now or you can always visit online in your own time. And then, let's see, um, it's, it's, cre it's critically important from there right, to build change at a system level, including trainings in this form of uh, adultification bias for authorities. So in part, that will require a new and deeper stage of research to draw on, and we're starting to prepare to engage in that research, and we look to you for help if you can make that possible. We're actually an independently 
funded organization, so if it's possible for you to support our work, that would be another way to help be part of the change. But most importantly, change depends so much on vision and activism. And that's what you'll find in the words of our next speakers, who I'll turn to now. We're going to hear from the two talented artists that we asked to respond to our work, Ashley Joy and Sancha McBurney. And we didn't know what these ladies would create. But as you'll soon see, they did an absolutely incredible job. And it's really beautiful to see the unique paths that they each took in getting to the pieces that they created. So I'm looking forward to hearing from them. And their pieces are uh, visible at the reception in the lobby when we leave the programming part of, the, of this evening. And our event will close with remarks by Naomi Wadler. Naomi is a powerhouse spirit in the form of a 12-year-old girl, and we're very proud that she serves as a youth advisor to the Georgetown Law Center on Poverty and Inequality. You may recognize her from her speech that she gave on the National Mall last year at the March for Our Lives event. I can't believe it was only last year. Her, her life has changed considerably since that speech, which really launched her meteoric rise to a nationally recognized activist at the ripe old age of 11. But first, we're going to hear from Ms. Payden Williams. And Payden agreed to travel here all the way from Ohio to be an important part of this event. And a special thanks goes to our partner, Fran Frazier of Rise Sister Rise in Columbus, who led to our being introduced to Payton. Payton lives out the mission that we believe in of elevating storytelling as a critical part of social change and achieving justice by centering the voices of black women and girls. But it takes courage to find your voice and share it with others. So I hope you'll join me in giving a warm welcome to Payton. Hello everyone, my name is Peyton Williams. I'm 20 years old and I live in Columbus, Ohio. I'm charter member of Rise Sister Rise Black Girl Think Tank and the former co-chair of our mental health campaign, I Am Good Enough. As a member of our think tank, I have learned to use my voice as a tool for change. I am also an appointed member of the Columbus Commission on Black Girls. The commission is tasked with assessing the quality of life for black girls in Columbus, Ohio. I am very glad to be here. Thank you to Sister Rebecca Epstein for the opportunity to share my story. I'm going to start all the way back when I was in kindergarten. I was about four and a half years old. That weekend, I had just gotten my hair done, and I was proud of the length and the beads that were in my hair. <laughs> As I was walking down the hallway, I had this little sway <laughs> that I would do because I loved to hear the sound of my beads. It wasn't nothing you know, too crazy. As we were walking to the bathroom, I remember my teacher turning to look at me and she abruptly yelled, stop walking like that. You're making too much noise and it's getting on my nerves. Nobody wants to hear you swing your head around like you're crazy. Of course, the kids in my life giggled because I had just gotten in trouble. But then she turned around muttering to herself as she walked away. I remember holding back tears as we finished walking to the restroom and then back to the classroom. From that day forward, I walked a little different. I didn't let the pride of whatever I was wearing, as in shoes or clothes or even my hair, show in my aura. I made the decision at four years old that I was already too much. But it made me wonder, what's the difference between me swinging my beads and the other girls swinging their hair? Another experience I've had is when I was in middle school. Going to an all-girls school, I seen adultification of black girls in various different ways. The one I can recall is when my principal suspended my whole bus the previous school year for the first two weeks of the next school year. My bus driver came to my principal and explained to her that the black girls in the back of the bus, she didn't specifically say black girls, but we all just happened to be black girls. And the back of the bus were being extremely disrespectful towards her. We were always talking back, and we were always moving and changing seats, those type of things. So my principal brought us all down to the auditorium, and she explained how disappointed she was in us. 
my fellow students and I tried to explain to the principal that we were not the only ones and that the bus driver did not sing out, single out everyone who was disrupting on the bus. The one girl in particular we were talking about happened to be a white girl who sat in the front of the bus. She loved to yell to the back of the bus and get up and move seats, but the excuse that my bus driver gave was she was in her blind spot so she couldn't see the girl. So long story short, um, <laughs> the principal told us that if we were to continue to act a fool on the bus that she would suspend us for the next school year. The, we were told, uh, I'm sorry, the girls in the back of the bus were told that, but not the girl that we called out. So long story short, she continued her actions, so we decided to raise hell on the bus, and the principal came in on the last day of school and told us we were suspended. Um, of course, no one remembered, so we still went back to school. <laughs> Reading through the Girlhood Interrupted Report, I found that I related to the girl who said, so we just discovered that the sky was blue. How do you guys feel about the sky being blue? There's always been something off about the way black girls are treated, but to actually have a, for lack of a better word, feeling backed by the research points out the problem that we need to work to find a solution to. While reading through the research, a few topics caught my attention. For my kindergarten experience, just the definition of a adultification bias, which is a stereotype where adults view black girls as less innocent and more adult-like than their white peers. It's not an evaluation of maturity based on observation of an individual girl's behavior, but instead the presumption applied generally to black girls. Also, it's worded as authority figures holding more adult-like standards of behaviors, as in you should know better. Also, it is the idea that punishment is the best way to respond when black girls make a mistake. Relating to my middle school experience, I felt that the section about the angry black woman stood out to me. Interpreting black girls' actions as threatening and disrespectful, especially when you're defending yourself with words and being punished for talking back, or saying you have an attitude problem or you're too sassy, or in schools they like to call it insubordination. Black girls are not allowed to be their authentic selves. We are put into a box where we can't be too loud, too bright, too bold, or else we threaten society's norms. In many ways, we are told to be smaller, quieter, lighter, and prettier, especially in middle school. My advice and wisdom to you all listening right now is that we need to improve cultural competency, especially with authorities that have lack of cross-cultural experience. Everything that a black girl does isn't threatening, it isn't insubordination, it isn't being sassy, and it isn't an attitude problem. <laughs> we also need to learn to communicate across barriers so that we can de-escalate situations instead of resorting to over-discipline. Also, just let black girls grow up on their own time. Let them enjoy the process. Thank you so much, Peyton. All right, Ashley, you are on. Ashley Joy is gonna talk us through how she created the pieces that we'll see downstairs. Come on up. Hello and welcome. Um, I'm Ashley Joy, the artist who painted the pieces for this event. Um, I go by Joy for most of my artwork and it's signed and trademarked under Joy. Um, I've been a visual artist for as long as I can remember and I really took to painting um, during a governor's school residency back in 99. I've been painting ever since and I attended Hampton University where I studied fine art and began exploring mixed media around 2009. Um, all of the pieces that I created today combine acrylic painting with a variety of textured mixed media elements. 
Um, I'm the mom to a wonderful seven-year-old daughter, Callie, and she's here today in the audience. <laughs> And she also has two of her own paintings on display. That's Kelly. <laughs> um, being the mom to a young black girl myself, the study of adult adultification bias um, in our girls really resonated with me. What stood out the most as an artist were the biased visual depictions of black women and girls that have been shown since slavery and how those have shaped biased opinions of authoritative figures in these girls' lives. At just seven years old, I've seen adultification bias impact my daughter um, in her childhood already. Um, in kindergarten, my daughter and her only other black classmate were absolutely held to a higher standard regarding their behavior throughout the school day. Um, in that very first year of school, I would often receive feedback that her teacher, um, from her teacher that my daughter, who often leaves me beaming in regard to her stellar behavior um, and manners, was talking back and um, making decisions with malice intent to disobey the teacher. So, for example, <laughs> it, was, it was interesting, but <laughs> for example, there'd be like where she knew, she, um, the teacher would say that she knew where she needed to put her papers, but chose to put them in the wrong box, um, rather than being a six-year-old who simply forgot her classroom routine that day. Um, my daughter would get in the car after school, and she was sad and disappointed in herself for not being able to meet up to her teacher's expectations, and I really saw it affect her self-esteem. Um, over time, I began to learn that the other black student's mother also independently shared the same perception, that our children were not being held to the typical standards of childhood, but instead the more rigid expectations of an older child who was making decisions to intentionally disobey. Um, we were in the thrust of the adultification bias in the treatment of our kids at the early age of five and six years old before we possessed a clear definition to apply to our experiences. Um, and so a couple of years ago, I began painting my own uplifting depictions of black women and girls. And um, they were both for my daughter and for others to see. So not only did it surprise me to learn that both black girls and women alike have longed for imagery that they can identify with, depicted as, this is what I paint, princesses, elves, other creatures of fantasy. But it has amazed me to watch my daughter's confidence grow while being surrounded by um, images of positive black females in our home. So she has taken, these Im taken to these images so much so that they've inspired her to create her own images. And those are the two that are on display. Um, that one was inspired by my Ella piece. And um, they're on display in the, uh, for the reception alongside the pieces that Georgetown commissioned me to create. So the inspiration for my first piece came from two places. Um, my work is often compared to that of Klimt, um, an Austrian symbolist painter like me. He uses a lot of gold leafing in much of his work, and he used it in this piece entitled Golden Tears. And there was a quote from the study that really stood out to me as well and inspired the first piece, and that is that a white girl's tears carry more value than a black girl's tears. And so these influences came together and produced my piece entitled Tears, and that's it there. And as you can see, the girl is also crying. <laughs> Thank you. She's also crying golden tears, which is my way of adding value to her pain. Um, and she's encompassed in a golden shield, symbolizing her need for nurturing, protection, and support. And the second piece that I created is the absolute largest of the three pieces and the largest painting that I've created to date. Um, it's inspired specifically by the need for an alternative vision of black women um, with real roots for our girls to look up to. Um, oops. 
In the study, we noticed that since slavery, as they mentioned before, black women have been depicted in just three categories, the Sapphire, Jezebel, and Mammy. And this really stood out to me because I wanted to offer the girls a fun, bold, imaginative piece depicting uplifting imagery that also roots back to slavery. Um, the subjects in this piece were carried over through storytelling during the slave trade and um, by the Yoruba people of present-day Nigeria. And these characters are based on Yoruba mythology and are, off, um, are traditionally referred to as Orishas. Yoruba mythology is something that I've been studying, so I was familiar and ready to take on the piece, but I wanted to really encompass myself in the history, so I took a visit to our Smithsonian Museum of African American History in preparation. And while I was there, I learned about Adinkra symbol, symbols of the Ashanti people from present-day Ghana, which is where Africans were taken from by ship during the slave trade. Um, symbolically, the fact that those were carried here from Africa was meaningful to me, and I decided to incorporate those into the piece as well. Um, I often had images within my paintings, within the details of my paintings, and here I hid the Adinkra symbols, symbols within the dresses and the headwear of the Orishas. I'll go through a few of them, but I encourage you to look. It's kind of like a scavenger hunt to find them um, during the reception. Um, each Orisha has colors, elements, and so much more, but generally speaking, uh, Ayo is the Orisha of air, Aja of the forest and animals, Yemonja is a mother Orisha who governs the sea and protects the children. Oya is the feisty Orisha of storms, and Oshun is of love and wealth. And these are my interpretations of each Orisha from a childlike perspective, and they're each offering their heart, their love, um, including a bouquet of hearted flowers for the girls. So to me, it was a gift to the girls. Um, a few of the hidden symbols are depicted here. The symbol for royalty is included in each Orisha alongside various others, including freedom, strength, learn from your mistake, and cowrie shells, which were the currency in Africa before and during the slave trade. Um, and finally, my third and most illustrative piece, Empower Her, is inspired by the call to action in the study to nurture, protect, support, and comfort our girls. For me, I do my part in activism by unapolog unapologetically offering a visual change in perception of black women and girls. Um, our girls should be, should be seen as young, innocent, and feel empowered to pursue all that their hearts desire. Everyone here today can also do their part to contribute to this effort and overcome the adultification bias in our girls. So that's the three as a collection. And that sums up my artistic contribution to the study. And I. <laughs> I just wanted to thank Rebecca for letting me be a part of this. It was so exciting. And um, thank you. <laughs> Wow, I feel really overwhelmed uh, by gratitude that Ashley produced what she did and um, so grateful for that partnership. And I almost feel guilty that we get to take these home to adorn our offices and everyone has come up to me and asked for them. <laughs> I think they belong with Ashley really, but I'm so, so uh, grateful to you, Ashley. So we're gonna hear from our next artist, Sancha McBurney, who we also commissioned to respond to our work and she's a photographer. So she's producing her own interpretation of our um, research in a completely different medium. And I think you'll be equally excited by her results. Come on up. Hi, everybody. Hi. Oh my gosh, I'm shaking. <laughs> uh, my name is Sancha McBurney. Um, I'm a photographer in the DMV area. Um, I also got my start in art. Um, I grew up drawing and um, painting, and um, I went to Morgan State University. I studied graphic design, and that's where I got into <laughs> photography. Um, I just wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about, I guess, my process for my pieces. Um, so I wanted to create a body and work, of course, trying to keep the study in mind. Uh, for me, I thought about 
a situation where I experienced it myself. And um, one instance in particular is when I was young, I was still a teenager, and I was working retail, and a gentleman came into our store, and he came up to, he was from Europe, he had a German accent, I believe, and um, he approached me and he asked me what my name was, and the first thing he said to me was, what is your name, Shaniqua? And then he says, and how many baby daddies do you have, Shaniqua? And then he said that, I'm sure you have a lot of boyfriends, don't you? And just thinking about some of the stories that they had and where they talked about, one of the young ladies mentioned how she had gone to the doctor and the doctor made this assumption that she had many sexual partners and she was um, very promiscuous. And I kind of thought about that when I was reading up on the um, project. So um, I went to the web website and read the studies and read some of these young ladies' stories. And one of the first ideas that I had was that I wanted to try to recreate some of those moments in the photo. So if something happened on like a playground, I wanted to take some of the young ladies to a playground and shoot portraits of them there, or one of the young ladies was in a gym and I was gonna shoot photos of her there because these were all spaces that these girls were supposed to feel safe and they were supposed to be protected by adults, whether it be the school or their basketball coach and that wasn't happening. So um, I wanted to take some photos of young ladies in these places. And then I dismissed that idea because we're artists and then we start a project and then we start judging ourselves and we start judging the work and then we change our minds so many times so I decided to go a different direction. So then I decided that I was gonna do some work with collage. So I was gonna take portraits and what I wanted to do was try to use paper to try to, um, to try to explore emotion and try to explore what these girls may have been feeling in these situations. So for one of the young ladies who was told that, you know, maybe she's too aggressive, I was just like, well, what happens if I take the portraits and then I cut out the figures and then I take the paper in, you know, someone who is angry, maybe that emotion burns. So what if I burn paper and added layers to it that way? Or someone who felt like they were, their innocence was being violated, then I thought of that as kind of tearing or shredding. So what if I did things where I tore the photo paper and then I thought, well, someone who was humiliated, you tend to crumble. So what if I start crumbling up all of the paper and doing different layers? And um, then I was like, we were going to do reproductions. And so then it was just like, well, you can't exactly reproduce that because then if I do all of these different layers, you're gonna lose all of the texture. So that idea got tossed aside. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of the third ideas that I had was that I tend to, I hyper-focus on the word erasure. So in the subtitle, it said girlhood interrupted and then it said the erasure of black girlhood. Um, so what I wanted to do was basically find ways that I could erase the girl. Um, I looked at the website and took some of the words that were actually some of the ladies used and one of them being that black girls have attitudes. And um, so what I was gonna do was take some of those labels into the photographs and put the labels on top of the girls' faces and find ways to try to remove them from it. So. One of these, um, so this model is Celea, and um, she's here somewhere. <laughs> there she is. <laughs> so one thing that you guys will notice, so in this picture, you know, I was looking at her posture and looking at what she had on and the torn jeans and the sneakers, and people tend to say that, you know, again, black girls are hard, we're tough, and we have this hard exterior. So what I was going to do was take the portraits put these labels on top of uh, their faces, which I actually got the, um, the idea, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Lorna Simpson, um, but I loved her work. It, it, something that I love about her work is what she omits from photographs. And um, so sometimes she would take a photograph of someone and their back is turned and she would omit things from them, she wouldn't show their faces, she would crop things out, but she also used a lot of text in her work. So this was um, the inspiration for this photograph. Um, 
So again, I wanted to use different words there. I also had another piece where I'd taken some of the images into Photoshop. I took this photo of Saleya into Photoshop and I put a brick wall over her because everyone always says there's this hard exterior, right? And we always have walls up. So um, I did that and then I thought, thought about it um, with some of the different girls trying to figure out different ways or different words or different phrases that I could use. I was also going to just go into Photoshop and erase parts of their faces and just remove as much of them from the photograph as I could. So that didn't stick either. <laughs> so at about 3 o'clock in the morning one day, I woke up and realized that I was really overthinking the process and that they didn't ask me to do collages and they didn't ask me to do paintings and they didn't ask me to go into Photoshop and change anything. They asked for a photograph. So um, I said one thing that really stood out to me is that I focused on this word erasure and I was finding all of these ways that I could try to remove the girls from the photograph. And I realized that that was the problem because people weren't seeing them. So instead of erasing the young ladies, I decided that I wanted you guys to see them. So see her. This is Celia, and um, I'm just going to show you some of the other photos that I took of the young ladies. One thing about the photos is when they came into the studio, I didn't want to coach them too much. Um, I didn't want to tell them how to pose. A lot of times people see black girls not smiling and they tell us that we need to smile to make ourselves seem warmer, to seem friendlier. And I didn't want them to force, I didn't want to force them to be anything other than who they were. So if they sat down in front of me and they wanted to put their face in their hands, I let them do that. If they wanted to sit down, I let them do that. Um, I just wanted them to be themselves. So I didn't ask them to smile. I didn't direct them too much on how to pose. What you see is exactly how they showed up. <laughs> And then there are also the pieces that are in the lobby. That's all. Thank you. So a funny story is that Sancha was originally introduced to us as a potential photographer of this event, so to document this event. But when we heard about her response to our research, we instead invited her to become a commissioned artist to do this work, and I'm so glad that we did that. So thank you very much. All right, our final speaker is Naomi Wadler, who I introduced before. So without further ado, Naomi Wadler. Thank you, I'm pretty short. Um, thank you so much for having me here tonight. I am proud to be associated with the Georgetown Center of Poverty and Inequality. They have truly helped me guide me in the work which I feel is so crucial to put out into the world on behalf of black women and girls. I am particularly thankful to Becca Shapiro and my dear friend and mentor, Rebecca Epstein. Rebecca has been an ally, a friend, and a teacher. Her work on adultification bias, on adverse discipline, and in establishing the trauma-informed school network for the Georgetown Center on Poverty and Inequality has given me hope and serves as a beacon for all girls of color to see the resources necessary for them to thrive. I am proud to be associated with you and so grateful to have this opportunity to speak to everyone this afternoon. As for the work of our two artists, Ash Ashley Joy and Sancha McBurney, wow, how cool are these ladies? <laughs> I hope that one day I can nurture a talent like you all have. It's just amazing. So why am I here? A 12-year-old Ethiopian girl talking to all of you adults and serious people on this Sunday afternoon. <laughs> You see, I'm a, about 18 months ago, I stood up for a girl named Cortland Arrington. She was shot in her school in Birmingham, Alabama by her boyfriend. As I have come to learn, she was sho he, was showing the, he was showing her the gun that he brought to protect himself at school, and it went off, killing his, this promising nursing student with a beautiful smile. 
Cortland's story was overshadowed by the news out of Parkland, Florida. The news of 17 students and teachers being slaughtered in their school by a killer with an AR-15. Her story was barely told. My fellow fifth graders and I decided to add a minute to our walkout to remember Cortland, who had been forgotten by the news society like so many other black girls. You might know the story from there. A reporter from The Guardian followed us on our walkout and interviewed us about Cortland. Now this, the online video, new, video news company came calling, and the next thing you knew, n <laughs> George Clooney was calling my mom. <laughs> my aunt... <laughs> My aunt knit an orange scarf, and, I was writing, and soon I was writing a speech to give in front of a million people at the March for Our Lives. What I knew when I was sitting on my couch writing that speech, what I knew while I was standing on an apple crate, kind of like today, in front of so many people giving that speech, and what I knew to know today is the girls who look like me are treated differently in this scary world we live in. Black girls are treated as less than, and quite honestly, I don't think any of us are here for it. I am 12 years old, and I am already tired of people, the news, our society, and me. <laughs> <laughs> and other people treating black girls as if they are not enough. Not good enough, not pretty enough, not smart enough, not enough of enough. It is not right. And it is time everyone here and everyone we know stands together to do something about it. Whether it is the teacher who comforts the white girl in school who mistakenly says the N-word while reading from our assigned book in English class, but never checks in with the black girl, with the black girls in the class to see if we are okay. To the cop who, ta who tackles a black teenager in a bikini for swimming in a pool a white woman wearing doesn't think she belongs in, from the girl in school getting sent home for wearing the same uniform as her white counterpart, but because of her natural genetics is considered more sexual. To the black student who is adversely disciplined by teachers in DC who are nine times more likely to expel them than their white peers. Enough. At five years old, I learned that Trayvon Martin was shot and killed because of his skin color. And there were people who believe I don't need nurturing. In kindergarten, my peers in Sandy Hook were slaughtered by, by somebody who wanted to kill them. But everyday, the everyday murders of little black children in Chicago are dismissed. But I should be considered an adult at six. At Tamir Rice, um, at 12, Tamir Rice was shot in mere seconds on a playground by police officers for carrying a toy gun. But but a white boy in Charleston shoots a church of black folks and is offered a hamburger on the way to prison. I am 12 years old, and let me tell you, that is not right. I remember a couple of years ago, a good friend of mine was, and I were making mus videos on Musical.ly, don't judge, we were like 10. Anyhow, this girl, white girl, was pointing her finger like a gun in the video. I showed it to my mom, thinking it was kind of cool. She got all serious and sat me down. She said, Naomi, you can never point your, you can, you can never make a gun sign with your fingers. You can never pretend to be shooting a gun. And most importantly, you can never take a picture or video doing that. I asked her why. Why could my white friend do that? And we all thought it was cute, but I couldn't be seen doing that. Na she said, Naomi, a picture of you pointing your finger like a gun could get you in trouble. It could cause people to think of you differently. It isn't right, but it's the truth. And you need to protect yourself from how others perceive you. She was right. And yes, people perceive black girls differently, even when they are 10 and making silly videos. And yes, it is not right or fair. It is in the same conversation when we talk about me wearing trending ripped jeans. But my mom said, ev but mom, I said, everyone wears them as I ratted off the list of white girls in my class. But I want the teachers to notice me for being smart, not wearing ratty clothing. How I dress matters more than how the white girls dresses too. Yeah, of course it does. The study from Georgetown shows that it does matter. Perceptions do matter. Black girls are seen as hypersexualized and aggressive. So when we are playing, it is not seen as play. And when we are being, being trendy, it is often seen as being sexual. And it isn't right or fair. So now, what do I do about it? Well, black girls like me are tired of having to do something about it. We are tired of having to teach our white counterpart parts, and let alone our teachers and other adults, how to treat us equally. We are tired of pointing out the privilege of our white friends. But we will stand. Black girls and women will lead the way, as we have done, have, as we have been at the forefront of every major movement in this country throughout history. We will tell our stories. We will stand strong on the shoulders of those who broke ground before us, just like we always do. But it is 
certainly time for more white women to step up. It is time for everyone to step up. I know many of you are here today because you stepped up. You study these issues, you live these issues, you are in the trenches. But we must redouble our commitment to lifting young black girls up. We must reject the media that misrepresents young black girls as dangerous, as adults, as sexual beings. We must fight against the bias in schools, work towards increasing the number of women of color in positions of power in school administrations, in the classrooms, as well as in the boardrooms and at the policy stations around this nation. Who here is mentoring a young black girl? Pledge today, right here, right now, to reach out to a young black girl and be her safe harbor. Teach her what is and is an acceptable treatment. Advocate for her and give her a platform to tell her story and be her ally. I mentioned Rebecca earlier. She has not only been one of my champions, she has been my sounding board. When I have questions about how people have treated me, she has given me good counsel on what I should and should not allow. I am blessed to have a support system. So many of my peers do not. Be a superhero to a black girl and leave, her to, and leave here today with that mission. It is my mission to use this little platform of mine to lift the voices of black and brown girls who are out here doing amazing things and to those who are struggling to get by. Each of them have remarkable potential, but only if we work together to fight the inherent bias facing them in every aspect of their lives. To the young black ladies in this audience, I say what I often say, success looks like you. Don't believe the naysayers, you are success. Stand in your black girl magic and use your power and speak your truth. Know that no, there are peers like me or so many other women in this room who will lift you up and who will help amplify your voice. You are magic, and if that scares some people, makes them want to make, makes them want to make you feel less than, it's because their po your power intimidates them. That, tr that is truly their problem. They have, they, have spent, they have spent generations trying to diminish us. They can beat us, they can put us in chains, they can humiliate us, and they can view us as dangerous and older than we are. But we are magical, and they can never take that from us. Use it. Use the magic passed down to you to stand strong, to know your worth, so that you, we can be queens, which we were born to be. As my girl Georgia Ann Muldrow said, let's try, for, let's try reaching for bigger goals. Let's try living the path we chose. Don't let them make you forget who you are. Don't let them break you down. Thank you. Well, that does it for me. <laughs> I'm way too overwhelmed to say anything more. And that's the end of our programming. Thank you so much, Naomi. You delivered, as you always do. So thank you for joining us and uh, being a part of this event. It means so much. Uh, so we welcome you downstairs for our reception to the lobby after we take some questions. So we're going to have a really brief question and answer period where I invite all the speakers to take a seat. In case our, I think we have a few time, a, a few minutes left for questions, right? <clears throat> yeah. Okay. So we have no moderator. We're just ready to take questions when you have them. Is that Jill? Jill? I really can't see with these lights. It's as you guys go around encouraging uh, black girls. What are you guys doing to encourage within the black race when we have a lot of? Uh, uh, black people kind of going against each other, this light skin, dark skin thing, or you know, black people always attacking each other. We tend to be our worst enemy. How y'all educating on that? Minorities um, typically self segregate themselves, so we get mad when white people make us separate from black people, or black people, white people make us separate from them, but we say that light skinned black girls and women are better than dark skinned black girls and women and that they are more acceptable. And by doing that, we're self-segregating and we're sabotaging ourselves. Um, and so I really want us all to know that we are no better than other people and that they are no better than us, but that we all have, are the same race and that we all come from the same place and we all need to stand together. She's, she's hard to follow. <laughs> she swear she stunned you into silence, and then she just hit you with the one, too. So, um, so uh, the work on colorism and looking within the black community, we haven't really tackled that yet. Um, but I think colorism is real. Um, 
It is um, the impact of white supremacy and racism, right? And it trickles down into our own communities. And so um, it's embedded in those conversation and those stories. You know, some, even though people don't talk about that, is the extent to which lighter skin black girls and women are treated differently and then how does that then impact you know their interaction so it's a good question but i think the first thing is that which we all we all have within our communities within our homes we talk about colorism all the time we talk about it it's at the dinner table it's embedded in our hair care products right, right. dr blake's hair look all right somebody else's hair look better right it, and so it's up to us to dismantle some of these things that are targeting our community, right? And the only way we do that is through conversations, is through dialogue. Now, I don't think those dialogues personally always need to be in the public sphere. I think those things can happen privately in community agencies, not-for-profit agencies. I know there's a number of organizations that are doing work on racial socialization to improve racial ethnic identity of not only black girls, but also black boys. Right, because the colorism runs deep and it's a function of slavery. But I'm, I mean, I'm not doing, outside of my research, any active work towards that, but I think it's important. But it starts within our own community, right? In our own conversations, in our churches, right? In our after school programs, in our community agencies. That's where it happens. It doesn't, all, all these conversations don't always have to happen on a public sphere, quite frankly. Can you talk about your research on colorism? Oh, she has a shout out, go ahead. I just wanted to say very quickly, I made a point with my largest piece to center the darkest skinned black woman because I never see that in, in any depiction. And um, I think if you want to have a conversation, you can use that piece of art to prompt a conversation. <laughs> yeah. So I've done some work that show that um, darker skinned black girls are suspended at higher rates than white girls and light-skinned black girls. So we have the research, but um, again, it's racial ethnic identity awareness, it's racial socialization, it's depicting images of black people with a range of features, it's challenging our beauty standards, right, and nose width, lip thickness, hair texture, and really asking ourselves why, right, and having these conversations with our children at the dinner table. Um, and we're talking about black women and black girls, and we often talk about this amongst ourselves, but we need to have this conversation with black men too, because the colorism is rampant in that community in terms of who black men find desirable and attractive, and that fuels a lot of the internalized racism that we experience, so. Um, we come from a really wide spectrum, you know, and you will find light skin all the way to super dark skin in, in our families and in our lines. And, you know, I think the biggest thing that we have to do is really check it when we see it. And when you see people say things, like I see a lot of stuff online because I'm always posting photos and things online and I'll see people hashtag team light skin, you know. And you see that so much or, you know, team light skin or long hair, don't care this. And we have to really start checking it when we see it. And I think it's also important for us artists to do that. Just like Ashley was saying that she made sure that she centered a dark skinned woman in her art. But even as, for me as a photographer, you know, the images that we put out is important. So I try to make sure that I'm not just picking a certain type for my work and I make sure that I want everybody to be seen. And when you see someone and you know, especially, um, a lot of dark-skinned women, you know, tend to be treated as they are, you know, less than a lot of, you know, light-skinned women or whatever, and you have to see them and remind them that they are beautiful, and you have to put those images out there so they know it, because saying it isn't enough, they have to be able to see it. First of all, thank you all for this great work, uh, from the art to the research. Just thank you for your work and for elevating these issues. A couple of questions about the research. Uh, first, we know obviously black girls are not one monolithic group. So, did you have any findings related to LGBTQ or gender non conforming youth? And also, can you talk a little bit more about some of the interventions, whether it's policy or practice interventions, to help address some of these issues? Uh, 
Um, so that's a great question. So when we invited black women and girls, we did, you know, we went across the binary, but most of the stories were for, um, came from cis female um, black girls. But as Rebecca and I have sh shared this work, we've had a lot of individuals ask us about um, the experiences of black GLBQ, GLBTQ, gender nonconforming um, girls and women. And that's not my area of expertise. And I really wanna pass the mantle for someone who is. I think that's an important work. I think it's something that we need to be talking about. We need to elevate it. But I think the worst thing you can do is to take on an area that you know very little about and end up doing more damage. And so anyway, if there's anyone with an interest in that, a passion, the space is wide open. Happy to mentor you on the areas that I do know. But it's, it's just, it's not, a, it's not a population that I have a depth of understanding. So that didn't unfortunately come up in the work, but I think it's important. Um, what did come out in terms of interventions is, you know, I think black women and black girls and black people are kind of over, over it in terms of, you know, we've talked about this, we've talked about this, what are you gonna do, right? And so they were at a point where information is not enough to change behavior. Right, and so the idea is we need to be, have programs, and this is the point of our Tell Your Story website, because there are, there are not-for-profits, there are agencies, community agencies that are out there doing the work, Wins Girls, right? Sister to Sister, I, I know some of these people, they're actually doing workshops and working daily with black women and girls, right? Um, they're doing interventions to address adultification bias, to educate girls, to provide them with strategies, with communicating with educators, going into schools and juvenile justice facilities to educate professionals. So they're doing that work and we hope that this storytelling portal will be a way to bubble up and create awareness of some of the work that those organizations are doing. If I may um, speak a little to the LGBTQ plus community that you speak of, um, my sister, my younger sister, she just had a birthday. She turned 19. She is lesbian. Um, she's what you would call a stud. Um, and what I can say about that is growing up with her, that's my little sister, that's my best friend. I will, <laughs> that's just, I love her so much. Um, but growing up with her, before she came out of the closet, as being lesbian, um, she dealt with a lot of the same things, well, still deals with a lot of the same things around the areas of adultification bias. Um, but whenever you come out of the closet, especially as lesbian, there are other areas to where the concern is raised. For example, the fact that boys view lesbians as more desirable because they want threesomes or whatever. Um, that's an area that raises a topic. Also, um, my best friend is transgender, male to female. Her name is Juliet Shakespeare. Yes, she copied uh, Juliet Shakespeare. That's one of her favorite books. <laughs> but her name is Juliet Shakespeare. Um, but when she was Julius Green, um, he dealt with a lot of things when it came to coming out of the closet about who he truly was. At first it was bisexual, and then it was just, you're just gay, you're just a fag, um, especially by the other boys and the other girls, especially in the school. But when she finally came into her actual truth as being Juliet Shakespeare, she got a lot of pushback from a lot of different people, especially in the school systems where she didn't feel comfortable going into the boys' bathroom, and she also didn't feel comfortable going into the girls' bathroom. So she was told that she was given special privileges by one of the security guards in my school. Um, the security guard basically refused to give her the key to the bathroom after one of the administrators already told her that if she needed to go use the restroom to ask one of the security guards to open up the private bathroom for her. So um, just speaking a little bit to what you say, I know I'm not an expert or anything, but yes, those type of things do still happen in the LGBTQ plus community.
Good evening, and I want to say thank you for the work. Um, I actually was not going to come tonight because I'm in my second year in my doctoral program, and I have a paper due at midnight. <laughs> <laughs> but I am so glad that um, my friend Christina encouraged me to come because this is like the area of research that I'm interested in. And so one of the questions that I have for you with doing this and looking at some of the stereotypes that are assigned to black girls, like just that intersectionality of when they do like assign these things as a defense mechanism because of like what the world puts on them. And so like a lot of times the attitude that is perceived isn't necessarily an attitude because they're trying to be disrespectful, but an attitude because they're trying to protect themselves because they've been in a position of being vulnerable and not being cared for and not being safe. And so how do you combat that? And so it's one of the things that's in the forefront because I just also started um, teaching in a middle school in Prince George's County. And I had to check myself with all the things that I knew and apologize to the kids after the first week and say to the boys and girls, you know, I told you like that you were being disrespectful without telling you what my definition of respect was. And so like going back and making sure that we see eye to eye on what behaviors like are acceptable and not assuming that they have any malintent. And so that's coming from a place where I am aware of these things, but still go into what you've been conditioned. So in the regards of black girls, like how do you like kind of manage like that or did that come up in the study? I think you answered your own question, which <laughs> as a professor, I love. <laughs> If I was your professor, I'd give you an A on that paper right now. But um, so um, I think the, the vulnerability and some of the socialization to be strong and to put up um, a defense to kind of guard against these stereotypes was definitely rampant in the report, right? So this idea that, you know, the strong black woman, right, we have to, we, we're raised to be that way because we're fighting off you know, some of the attacks that might come. But but I think what you just said and um, the artists who depicted See Her really captures how you balance, right, this kind of defensiveness, disrespectfulness. Like, you have to see these children. You have to pull back. You have to have a conversation. You have to define the expectations that you want from them, both emotionally and behaviorally and academically. You have to remember how old they are and what they are really capable of doing at, at, at that stage. I always have to remember my 14-year-old, her prefrontal cortex is not developed yet. Her prefrontal <laughs> cortex is not developed yet, right? Like I say that in the mirror often, every day, because she does some crazy things. I'm like, why'd you do that? And I'm like, your prefrontal cortex is not developed. Right, so you have to remember developmentally where they are and make sure your expectations are, de are accrued to that. And also, you have to think about how you were raised, your values and who you are and how that shapes the way you look at what's acceptable, right? And then the last thing is, you know, I'm not that old, but my kids remind me I am that old. You know, like I call a phone a device. They're like, what is a device? And I'm like, you know what I mean, right? But, I didn't grow up in the, in the, in, under the social media. There wasn't this pressure. I used to go to school looking like a hot mess all the time, right? I didn't have this pressure. I didn't have Instagram models. So they're, they're also growing up differently, right? Their experience with the world is different. And so you have to take all that in consideration to really see all children, but see black girls for who they are and give them the opportunity to make mistakes and talk to them. It doesn't mean that you don't hold someone accountable, right? If, but you have to explain, this is what I mean. So being very, ex I'm a psychologist, so there you go, right? So I can break this down. Being very explicit. Oftentimes we're implicit in our expectations, and I'll give you an example. My kids grew up in an era where they only know phones that have caller IDs. So they did, they, I never taught them how to answer a phone. And I'm nostalgic, I have an old school phone, it, it, looks, it almost looks like a rotary phone, they have a caller ID. And they'll pick up the phone like, yes, I live at such and such address, my mom is not home right now, the back door is unlocked. Like they'll just start, <laughs> they'll just start talking, to, and I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> oh my gosh, right? But it's because I didn't explicitly teach them how to, I just assumed they knew because my whole existence was, this is how you, hello, you, who would you like to speak to? My kids don't do that, hey. 
because they're used to caller ID. So we have to be explicit, break it down and teach them what we expect from them and then give them room to grow and develop into that. Hi. Speaking on the behalf of me being a 13-year-old black girl, people at my school feel like they're pressured of looking like somebody or having like the latest technology or like having this type of hair or you you can't be skinny or too big and you have to like meet other people's expectations when you shouldn't have to feel that way. And I wanted to ask people like me who feel like they want to say something, how do they make their voice heard? I don't know if this answers your question, but whatever the first thing that comes to your mind um, when you think of how you can make a difference, whether it's putting up a poster or writing a book or writing for a local newspaper, anything that you, even just having a conversation with people, it doesn't have to be the biggest gesture, but you also shouldn't look to other people to find your definition of success, but you should look within yourself and whatever you think is successful is what you should do. Thank you. We might have time for one more question. No, we don't. <laughs> OK, I think we're out of time anyway. So thanks to all of you. It's a great, so good. <laughs> Milani, do you have some final words to inspire? Yes, you? OK. Um, let's give them all a hand. This was a wonderful presentation. If you enjoyed this, please make sure that you leave a comment card, that you go to the website, that you let the museum know. Um, we are expanding how we're doing programs here. Um, we are here to serve, uh, and we use art as a vehicle to do that, to champion women, and this is a priming example of how we do that. So another hand for them. I know we did it already, but why not? <laughs> Um, the reception downstairs is, uh, there'll be some refreshments for you, and you could take the doors back there. And thank you all, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Georgetown, thank you, Ashley, thank you, Sancha, thank you, all of our speakers, thank you, Naomi, thank you all for coming. Thank you for coming from all the way from Columbus. Thank you, good night.